My name is Ron Dembo and I'm the founder and CEO of Zero Footprint. This talk is about the role that citizen engagement and behavior change play in making cities resilient. So here we have a wonderful picture of Toronto taken in the fall, beautiful, serene, and seeing it morph into a storm that we had actually a few weeks ago that was called a one in a hundred year storm. The unfortunate thing about these storms is they're occurring much more frequently than one in a hundred years. So resilience is the ability to recover readily from diversity, adversity. And climate change, I always think of as being that adversity, the volatility that you experience. And that's exactly what will happen. Climate change isn't just about things getting warmer, it's about things getting more volatile. So, um, one way to think of resilience is to think of how we might hedge out that volatility. It's a financial way of thinking of it, but it actually works very well. I think of climate change as really a big risk management problem. So, for example, in Toronto, we know that the hot days in Toronto will travel. A hot day is defined as a day you know, close to 40 degrees with very high humidity. And we know that uh, the average number of hot days in the past has been 20 a year. And we expecting that to travel to 60 a year by 2030 with great certainty. And yet, when we look at how builders build buildings, and I'm going to give you examples of some of those, they actually built for a climate that, that was yesterday's climate. So what we will experience because of climate change is higher and higher electricity demand because there's going to be hotter and hotter days. Um, but they won't all be hot. There'll be hotter days, there'll also be colder days colder than in the past. And we know that when you get within 10% of a peak, you know, to satisfy that extra 10%, you, you are going to spend 40% of the cost of the system. So allowing those peaks to go higher and higher in terms of electricity demand will cost, you know, much more than just a linear growth. Weather will also become much more extreme, you know, within any 24-hour period, we have uh, rainfall, uh, and the storm I shown you, showed you was actually one of the most extreme in, in the last hundred years. And that rainfall can actually have a huge cost. The cost in our case was billions of dollars. Trains were stranded, cars were stranded, the highways were flooded, and worse, unexpectedly, the electricity system really came to a halt. So, um, when we talk about uh, resilience, we typically think of infrastructure. How do you make things stronger, more efficient, and so on. We seldom talk about behavior. But if you were to think of how they play out, probably behavior is a very big part of keeping things together. And I want to show you some examples of that. But the biggest challenge is how do you influence behavior? So I want to give you an example of how you don't influence behavior. Just during that, that rainstorm, two of the main generators in Toronto collapsed, they were flooded, the city was almost out of electricity, and people had their doors wide open in, in stores, blasting cold air out, they were air conditioning. And the city wanted to engage them to reduce that, to switch off electricity, to deal with this crisis. So here's what happened. This is how they did it. They sent this email to everybody. And in this email was an attachment that if you bothered to read the email, then bothered to read the attachment, they were going to ask you in a very genteel Canadian way, you know, please would you switch off your electricity? We're having a crisis. Clearly, this is no way to engage people. One of the things we need is fire drills. Firemen know how to do this well. We do this well for fires. They're drilling all the time, preparing for the next fire. And the next fire is never the same as the last, but they know what to do. So what should we do in case of peak load problems? Well, we should basically move electricity out of peak. Anything that's not essential to be run at peak, but could be run later, like a, a load of washing, should be moved. But to get people to change their behavior, is not just simply going to be a matter of cost. You're going to have to reward them. For example, like pay them. Uh, um, and you could think of this like congestion pricing. Congestion pricing works pretty well. In Singapore, on the roads, as it gets more and more congested, 
there's a billboard that will say how much you're paying per kilometer. And when it starts saying you're paying $10 for the next kilometer, you might want to get off that highway. And that's the same, we could do the same with peak loading. Um, what should we do in the case of a storm surge? Well, we should have fire drills that prepare us for storm surges. What should we do in the case of an electrical outlet, uh, outage? Same thing. Get ready for it by having those fire drills. So there's a social side to resilience. Here's the tw 2003 blackout in the East Coast. It essentially brought in, uh, the economy down to its knees for a few days. Toronto was completely blacked out. But the kind of thing that happened, and I was there during the blackout, was we just walked downstairs and started to party with the neighbors. Um, people just out of the blue just got onto the streets and stood at traffic lights, you know, directing traffic. And this happens when a citizen's engaged. It doesn't happen in cities where citizens are not feeling a part of it, although that is their problem. So here's an example. New York in 1977 had a blackout. Different time, different period. And guess what happened? New York looked like this. There was extreme looting going on. Rioting. Take the same city, fast forward to 2003, completely different city. Anyone who lived in New York in the 70s knows how dysfunctional it was and how, how unsafe the streets were and how problematic it was to take subways. And now in 2003, it's a lovely city to live in. Crime has dropped dramatically. And they had a blackout, the same as the Toronto blackout. And guess what happened? People got together and helped each other. I'll give you another example of flooding. Here's Calgary in 2013 versus New Orleans in 2005. So New Orleans was flooded by Hurricane Katrina. It came to a standstill. That's what it looked like. And what happened was, once again, major looting, rioting, and the police were even told they could, could shoot at looters. And if you saw this picture, you might ask, is this Iraq or is this New Orleans? Calgary, on the other hand, had a storm, you know, worse than ever, ever been, it's ever been recorded. It's on a river, and that river flooded. The entire downtown was... was underwater, every single major building was out of electricity. Uh, the, the big event in Calgary is a stampede, and this is what the stadium in, in, in Calgary looked like two weeks before the stampede. So what happened there was people got together. In the case of the stadium, um, pr the private sector and individuals got together and made this stadium clean, and it opened up two weeks after the flood. Cities with an engaged population are more resilient, there's no question. Um, when I think of engagement, I think of it as a big untapped resource. It's the one thing we typically bypass, and it's a huge opportunity. So the question is, how do we go after this resource? What do we have to do to engage people? So I think of people today as being very connected, the people we want to engage mostly are on the internet and get things delivered in the way they, they want. They are, they have a, a, a world that's defined around them. And they're not influenced by just uh, one aspect of that, their electricity usage or their um, health or whatever. They're interested in their life, the whole lot. So that typical person might have and interact with many, many um, brands. They might work at, the, at RBC, have a, have a um, credit card with the American Express, buy their groceries at Loblaws. These are big brands in Canada. So if you would like to engage those people, you need to engage them around their life, not around yours. So the way you do this with software is by creating layers of software that can address this individual and pointing that software at the individual. So for example, um, you need a layer of data because you need to be able to get data from all sorts of sources that that individual reacts with, from, from smart meters that give electricity instantaneously to once in a month a report from a hospital and so on. You need analytics that take that data and turn it into useful information. And then you need engagement tools that can present that data in a form that individuals can understand, non-experts. But finally, 
people are motivated by rewards, whether they're intrinsic or otherwise. Rewards are a fundamental part of any engagement system. So we've built this around a rewards platform. This is what it looks like on the web, and it's a push environment so that if someone actually is involved here, they get alerts when something goes wrong or some event occurs. They don't have to go out and keep on looking for things. They see their energy as part of their daily life, as the, as the wallpaper on their calendar. They see their utility bill, you know, in one glance, in 15 seconds, they can tell you everything that they need to know about electricity, gas, and water. And it's evidence-based. Evidence-based is important because if we're going to reward people, we have to make sure that we're rewarding people for actually doing things and not for pretending to do things. So here are some examples of evidence-based applications. These are particularly about paying people for energy uh, that they're not using. And what you're seeing here is not only individuals, but you're shown compared to your, your peer group as well. And that peer pressure is there. So I'm going to talk about another area of your life, which might be health. And if you look at health costs in the US, it's, it's reached an unsustainable level. Uh, an average household income might be 45000 and the health costs per household are 26000 So how is that possible to sustain itself, given that it's on the rise? So here's a simple thing that we could do to really improve health across the country, in the, uh, across the whole country. And you wonder why it hasn't been done. It's been researched to death. It's, it's that if we were to walk, everybody in the U.S. were to walk 30 minutes a day, which is actually a low threshold, it would make a huge difference to the health costs in the U.S. And yet you ask, why hasn't that been done? Well, um, that's, for example, one of the things that we're attacking. How do we get those people to walk 30 minutes a day? And we do it by providing them with apps where they are. It could be on their, on their phones, on their pads, on their computers. Uh, and it shows them in very graphical, simple ways where they are towards that goal and what rewards they might have collected. Um, so this is me and the top five. Uh, and I'm showing you myself doing pretty well, but not as good as the best. And, you know, we have others that are just not keeping up. So group pressure is a good form of getting people to do stuff. So let me tell you very quickly about a tale of two cities. One that's resilient and one that isn't. And they both are the same city. That city is Toronto. And I'm going to talk about Toronto A, which is a sustainable, resilient, human, innovative city. And there it is. It's the old-fashioned district. And Toronto B which is unsustainable. So Toronto A has buildings that look like this. They're old buildings. They've been reinvented many, many times. This is my old company. It's a high-tech software company. And that's what it looked like when we came into it. But in this building now, uh, which has evolved since I first came in, you have a design company, you have a, an environmental company, you have a think tank for urban work. The interior of the building looks really welcoming. Um, downstairs, as you walk out, there's an espresso bar. People actually use it as a workspace. Uh, there's no place I can walk to there without bumping into someone I know in two minutes and, you know, talking about changing the world. There's art, graf you know, graffiti art that's pretty good. There's streets right nearby where there's shops, uh, things that you might need, just a place to hang out. And here's the not sustainable part of Toronto very new, it's not resilient, it's inhuman, I believe, and not innovative. This is called Toronto B in my language. It's the old railway lands and a beautiful opportunity for Toronto to create a whole space close to the water, sustainable, lovely place to be. Instead, we chose to build a whole bunch of glass towers uh, occasionally glass falls out of these towers, they're not well built, they are expensive, they are, um, you know, partially empty, they are um, n not resilient at all. And if you were to go downstairs from in one of those places where you don't know who your neighbors are, you don't interact with many of the people around you, 
you would land up at a supermarket that looks like this, which is the last place in the world you'd want to talk about changing the world. So um, I want to leave it at that and leave you with a thought that before we